Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. We're just going to wait a couple of minutes for everybody to come through from the waiting room, and then we'll be starting. I think we're almost there. Okay, I think I think we're all here. So welcome um, to this webinar. For those of you who have just arrived, um, just to make you aware that this webinar is being recorded and a recording will be shared to participants who have registered. Great, so um, welcome. This webinar <clears throat> this afternoon will be talking about the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism or also known as CBAM. And uh, we have a, a very nice panel of experts who will be talking us through um, uh, this, the, the scheme and how it works. And they will be also on hand to answer any of the questions you might have. So um, to that point, there is a panel at the bottom of your screen named Q&A. So please feel free to add your questions there. We'll be seeing them and answer them either during the webinar or right at the end. So my name is Emmanuel Gianquito and I lead training and consultancy at Chamber Customs and it's my pleasure today to chair this panel. So let me introduce the speakers for today. So we have Professor Luca Taschini from the um, Edinburgh University. Um, so uh, Professor Taschini comes from the Faculty of Climate Change, Finance and Investment and has a wealth of experience on working on, on the carbon border adjustment mechanism and effective carbon pricing policy. So that we'll be hearing um, from his point of view um, today. We're also joined by George Riddle from um, Ernest & Young and uh, George um, heads the trade policy and strategy team and helps companies preparing for CBAM amongst various other things uh, amongst the other things that um, George brings is his experience at the WTO and uh, uh, the UN um, as a representative. So that will be a very interesting uh, point of view to hear. And last but not least, we're joined by um, our colleague William Bain, Head of Trade Policy at the BCC, wealth of experience um, advising and helping companies um, understanding uh, how to navigate the world post-Brexit. Well, and before Brexit and through Brexit. So um, William has had a um, lot of exposure to that. So um, that's our great panel for today. <clears throat> so I guess the first question, and I'll let you guys decide who wants to take question number one, is can we have um, a very brief explanation just for those of us who might not know what the CBAM is? You know, what are we dealing with? What are we talking about? and then we can go more into the detail. So I don't know who would like to, to start with what is CBAM? Happy to take that if uh, William and George are okay with that. So um, perhaps before even talking about EU CBAM, let me say just a few words of the uh, concept behind uh, uh, the carbon adjustment in general. So um, this is, typically a policy that plays or try to place a cost on the carbon emission associated with imported goods. So the, the idea of a any general BCA, border carbon adjustment, is to ensure that foreign producers pay a price per ton um, of the CO2 emission that is somehow equivalent or very close to what a similar positioned uh, domestic producer will pay domestically. So uh, the, the, the BCA in principle has two key main objectives. One is leveling the uh, playing field and the other one is preventing carbon leakage. So leveling playing fields means that you want to ensure that domestically producer uh, domestically producer of goods are not 
output at a competitive disadvantage when they are compared to imported goods, uh, especially when it comes to environmental regulation, specifically in this particular case for the carbon adjustment. And ideally, this should help maintain a certain level of competitiveness of the domestic industries with respect to uh, non-domestic uh, industries. Uh, uh, there are uh, the, the domestic ones are subject, in fact, to whatever type of uh, more stringent regulations. Uh, regarding preventing carbon leakage, um, leakage occurs every time you have a domestic industry that might relocate their production to regions with less stringent um, regulations. So in with this particular case, again, will be less stringent emissions regulation or even absence of emission regulation. So the idea is that any sort of a carbon adjustment should discourage uh, this by holding imported goods accountable for their emission embedded carbon emissions. Now, just briefly now on the on the idea of um, of the EU CBAM. So the idea is again uh, leveling the playing fields and prevent leakage. The and I'm pretty sure that Will and George will tell us a little bit more. But the the idea is now uh, to divide this uh, the mechanism within which the EU CBAM will be implemented into two phases. And the, I think the most interesting one at the moment will be the monitoring phase. So during this period, uh, importers are required to measure, and that's I understand will be very very difficult because we 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 have to start collecting all this data to measure and report the embedded emissions, carbon emission in their imported products. However, during this period, no uh, charge will be applied. Then starting from 2026, sorry onwards, we will see some charging of uh, emissions that's uh that's that's very interesting thank you i think that the concept of carbon leakage and and relocating to less stringent markets is definitely uh, something to watch out for so that we can be responsible importers that's something that uh in chamber customs we, we look after as well when we advise importers on what to do but george perhaps you could um expand on that and start perhaps give us some ideas on how will this work in practice for, for companies? What what do companies have to do to prepare for this? It doesn't sound very easy. Thanks, Emmanuel, and it's a pleasure to be here um, on the webinar today on what is the final day of, of International Trade Week. I'm, I'm sure for everyone who's been attending the many events, you've made it through. The, there's only a couple more hours left of International Trade Week. So uh, great, great to be ending on a discussion on CBAM. So I think that it's really interesting around what the impact of this new regime is is going to look like for anyone who touches um, the trade with the European Union. I think first, just taking a perspective of what's actually covered by these this new arrangement, and as we enter the transitional phase, which started on the 1st of October of this year, we have six main um, products that that are covered by the CBAM regulations. So those are aluminium, iron and steel, cement, fertilizers, electricity, and hydrogen. So if you think about the those sectors, yes, they are carbon intensive, but they also form the foundation of nearly every product um, that, that is used in an in industrial sense. So really quite foundational to the, the trade that many have with the EU. And there is a very low threshold um, for, for those imports into the EU going forward, which is 150 euros per consignment. So there's, in fact, you know, even um, even an IT firm importing um, bolts or screws, which, you know, come from outside of the EU, will be covered by the CBAM regulation and require them to um, make the necessary declarations. So this isn't something just for the big importers, the big industrial players. It's actually something that, that really needs to be looked at by um, nearly every company that, that will be trading with the EU. So as Lucas said, we're, we're now in this transitional phase um, and there's a couple of deadlines that, that are worth being aware of as, as we move forward with, with this new regime. So the first um, reporting deadline for, for the quarterly CBAM report is the 31st of January, 2024. So companies who, who are importing into the EU, the, the covered CBAM products are gonna need to register 
as as um, authorized CBAM declarants. Um, the transitional registry is now live, um, so so that is possible for them to start um, that process. And then for all the consignments that they've um, made from the first of October until the thirty first of January, will need to be reported through that that first reporting deadline. Every quarter thereafter, um, we we will have CBAM reports being due. What's interesting is the first two reports, um, there, there is more leeway around them um, from a number of different perspectives. Those first two reports will allow the use of um, default values for the amounts of embedded carbon that, that are contained within the products. So you don't necessarily need for those first two reports that sort of embedded emissions data that Luca was talking about, but from the third report, which is due on the 31st of July, 2024, you will need to start doing that information. So effectively you have nine, well, seven months from, from today in order to be doing those calculations um, in, in order to get the necessary information. Um, and then from 2025, the, the European Commission will be starting to review the scope of the CBAM. So it's not something that's going to just remain those six products. There is actually a huge scope for expanding that out um, into the future with every product that's currently uh, under the EU's emissions trading scheme potentially being covered by the, the EU CBAM. You also have the cost implication coming in with CBAM certificates needing to be bought and also um, additional verification requirements around the the accuracy and veracity of the of the quarterly CBAM reports from 2026 onwards. So there's a lot of different deadlines. I think the, the headline message here is it's not something that you just do once and, and that's fine. It's something that's going to require quite active monitoring um, and compliance over the next couple of years as the regime evolves. Fantastic. Thank you for that. I mean, there's plenty, plenty to do to get ready. And we are talking of an EU scheme at the moment. This is uh, this is what, what we're discussing. And, and just for clarity, uh, George, can I ask you, um, what are the key charging um, criteria on, on CPAM? You mentioned a per consignment. I understand there is something per ton. What, ha what should traders um, understand? So in terms of that, <clears throat> excuse me, the trade information that's required um, for those quarterly reports, some of it is um, customs information that many traders will be familiar with. Um, so it's things like um, detailed da data around the HS codes, origin, um, quantity, weight, customs procedure, those, those things that you know would be normally um, inputted as part of a customs declaration and, and other um, border procedures. Where I think that that data requirement is less um, less evident at the moment is one calculating the actual embedded emissions. Now, many companies around the world already do this, but they do it on a yearly installation basis. They don't do it on a consignment basis. And the EU's come up with a new uh, framework for, for doing those calculations. However, you know, making sure that you're able to translate your existing um, emissions um, monitoring into a per consignment um, calculation is not going to be easy for many companies. We know that there's quite large data gaps um, that, that exist, and particularly where companies, you know, have quite extensive supply chains, getting that information from your suppliers is, is quite often a challenge depending on sort of what stage in the value chain you, you happen to be, or indeed providing data for products that end, end up eventually being imported into the EU. The final element that I would say the, that these reports require is around the um, amount of carbon tax or price that has already been paid on those products. And I think that's a very important thing for, for companies not to forget about because it will be you'll be able to offset the carbon price that's already been paid against those eventual CBAM certificates, bringing down the eventual cost um, of the regime. If you're not reporting and tracking that now, the eventual cost of the CBAM certificates is going to be considerably higher 
for those products. So it, it's to that third element that while may not seem as immediately important, the cost considerations will be um, from 2026 onwards. Absolutely, thank you for that. And uh, my uh, my next question, I'm hoping that that William will be able to to help us with a bit of a you know future looking. I mean, clearly we're talking about the EU CBAM. You know, the EU uh, with with uh, is clearly a, a, an incredible partner for trade for the UK and the F, uh, you know the free trade and cooperation agreement that we have helps us a lot. So the, the two part question, William, is like what do we know um, or what do you think is going to happen in terms of a UK implementation of a similar mechanism or, or to, to CBAM? And how do you think that might interact with the EU um, scheme? Mm, it's a very interesting question, Manuel. Um, and <clears throat> of course, a few weeks ago, there was a, a meeting which took place uh, between government and industry um, around the issue of emission trading scheme, uh, future policy development. And really at that meeting, there was unanimity from business and industry that ETS linkage, which is conceived of uh, and has a legal basis within the trade and cooperation agreement, uh, that that should occur at the earliest possible opportunity for the reasons George has set out. Uh, because what we've seen uh, since the end of the transition period in particular is a sort of de-alignment of carbon pricing of certain commodities between the EU ETS and the UK ETS. Now, the Chancellor made an intervention uh, several weeks ago, which has um, begun to uh, restore some of the alignment in prices and some commodities at least, so it's had an impact. Um, but UK companies would still face, uh, in the means that George has described, um, effectively paying the difference um, between you know, the input carbon price uh, in, in the UK and, and the overall uh, value of the emissions embedded in the goods uh, when they're sold into the European Union. So there are, could be a fiscal consequence from 2026. Um, and of course, what that's led countries like Turkey to do recently is to come to the policy uh, conclusion uh, that to have linkage of the emissions trading schemes uh, with that of the EU um, is really fundamental for, for trade. Um, and so the BCC's position, having thought about this issue over the last few months and consulted the network, uh, is that we too favour ETS linkage. Um, we do believe that there will have to be a UK CBAM, the, the, the right approach to deal with this. Um, the best approach for the UK is to have a similar mechanism. It's very interesting, we've heard this week that India is considering adopting uh, a similar approach. Um, of course, the US approach is very different. What they're doing is using the awesome fiscal firepower that they have and the power of the Fed to uh, incentivize production of uh, green technology and to see the change to uh, net zero compliant technologies being done that way. Um, but in uh, the European neighborhood, um, the approach of having carbon pricing, cap and trade, um, a CBAM is important. Now, the key thing that would occur with ETS linkage is that CBAM provisions between UK and EU trade would then fall away. Um, but of course, we would still require that CBAM for goods coming in from outside the European Union. Um, and, and any other agreements we make with countries uh, involving ETS linkage. So ETS linkage is the very important precursor of where policy can develop in the next few years. Um, you know, we've been very clear uh, that um, we see this as, as a priority, um, both next year and in 2025, but preferably as soon as possible, 
for government to take this on board, uh, invoke the uh, pr procedures within the TCA to begin discussing this with the EU and to begin to act. Um, because 2026 will be along before we know it. And effectively, business really just has two years um, to prepare for and the, the, the prospect of having uh, a sort of fiscal element and having to pay um, a fiscal element to the European Union uh, when it is import exporting goods uh, to customers in the EU. So that's something we really want to avoid as a Chambers Network for very good trade and economic reasons. That's why we encourage policymakers to get on with linkage considerations as soon as possible. Absolutely, thank you for that. And I'm, I'm thinking, I mean, in, in from what we see in terms of like helping traders trading, uh, you know, policies should be there to ensure that trade happens in a healthy way, um, and and to support trade. Now, uh, George mentioned six main products covered by CBAM, and uh, you know, if we consider those six, aluminium, iron, cement, fertilizer, electricity, and hydrogen, we covered a very big section of the commodities that you know are used so if i can go back to luca and ask you know what what sectors uh, if that can be answered but you know what are the key sectors that in, in your opinion from a like macro area macro point of view are, are mainly impacted by that and then hopefully we can actually understand what we're doing here in the uk to help those sectors prepare so i don't have an exact precise answer, uh, but based on uh, what I've been reading so far and some of the analysis we've been doing, we have obviously the major partners uh, that are that are going to be affected are uh, US, China, even Russia, you would be surprised. Uh, China, Russia, um, uh, US, and many of the other India, many of the other Asian countries that are also some of the African countries are, are going to be affected quite, quite heavily, depending on which country we are considering. And in terms of sectors, is predominantly uh, in Europe uh, will be predominantly the sectors that make use of those uh, components, in particular the aluminium uh, or steel uh, and uh, components. So we're talking about the automotive sectors, for example, is going to be uh, quite heavily uh, affected. Um, IT as well. Uh, George was making a very compelling uh, example where even IT industry, even a small IT company might be quite heavily affected, uh, uh, affected by this. So it's really, I would say, it's really all over the place. That this, uh, I don't see, uh, I don't see, I don't see industries that are will might be not potentially affected, and that it might be also an expansion of the uh, of the uh, um, uh, commodities that, that will be regulated of the of the product that might be actually regulated. So actually, this is quite a a, a wide ranging policy. Georgia, do you have any more insights from between and linkages between the key areas of products covered and the areas of industry that may be affected? Sure, thank you. I I think in t in terms of that question, if you look who's most heavily impacted, it's going to be advanced manufacturing, it's going to be automotive, and it's going to be construction. They're the three that sort of where you see the bulk of the products um, going in, in in terms of the heavy usage. So they're the ones who will end up, you know, in all likelihood having the highest exposure, particularly the, the cost exposure to the CBAM regime. In terms of um, consumer products and retail, right now, um, it's around the aluminium. Aluminium is quite a largely, you know, widely used product for packaging. Um, if you look how much is in, you know, whether it's in drinks, whether it's in food, whether it's in um, specific um, blister packs for for different medical products. So in, in the in the consumer space, uh, it's much more around that aluminium right now. But the C potential CBAM expansion, um, where you know it's considering to go to glass, paper, cardboard, polymers, suddenly becomes a much wider um, concern for the consumer and, and retail sector. So it really depends on sort of your import profile. It depends on what products you're using. Obviously, it's hard to sort of give 
you know, exact specifics that all of these types of companies will be impacted, but sort of with some broad trends within the market that we're currently seeing. That's, uh, that's true. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm curious, I don't know if this is a, a, a something that it's, it's possible to answer, but um, Luca highlighted some of the drivers behind uh, the introduction of CPAM and, you know, the, the I think that the first two points uh, made were, you know, to prevent carbon leakage and to create um, a level playing field. Now, what do you think that in practice will happen, especially in the early days of CBAM? How will trade react? Because we've seen already with Brexit that, um, you know, some 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 of the trade habits and um, um, customary purchasing uh, things, for example, they changed. So what, what do you think will happen? How, how do you think trade will react to the introduction of CBAM? So a, a couple of observations here. Um, the first is, you know, CBAM is an imperfect policy response. In an ideal world, we would have a global carbon price and there would be no carbon leakage and, and this type of policy and, and border measure wouldn't be required. Um, that said, I think we are going to see a number of jurisdictions um, implement um, similar CBAM regimes. Um, they'll be designed slightly differently and called different things, um, but a number of jurisdictions have already been mentioned, but you know, the UK has done their consultation, Australia is currently consulting, Canada's consulting, Taiwan's consulting. So there's quite a few different jurisdictions around the world that, that are considering these mess these types of issues, and I think that will have an impact on trade flows. You also have the ongoing talks between the EU and US on the green steel and aluminium arrangement, um, where the US is trying to defer the impact of CBAM on US exports in particular. Um, that will have you know, an impact if the EU and the US are able to find some sort of accommodation around the CBAM question. Then the final point, just on the commodity markets, in some for some of the covered commodities like um, green steel, there is theoretically enough green steel that you could end up with a situation where that green steel is being exported to the EU because it's more cost effective to do that. And then the rest of the world ending up with the slightly dirtier or more carbon intensive steel um, being effectively dumped in their markets. So there is diversionary impact, which is possible as a result of, of the measure. However, for some like ammonia, like cement that are just intrinsically carbon intensive, it will just be um, a case of pushing the cost of those um, products within the EU up, um, which will have a sort of domestic economic impact um, over the course of the life of the regime. It's, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, can I look up, of course, yeah, please. Can I add one element here? And this is something that uh, George mentioned. So any sort of adjust, adjustment uh, will be will be calculated considering two elements. One is actually the carbon emission content and the other one will be the price differential. So I think that will also play a big role, especially when considering where you might actually want to import uh, your goods from. So you might actually considering changes in, in the supply chain or slight changes in the supply chain, or even just basically moving from one particular uh, installation that is owned by one multinational into a different one uh, due to the fact that uh, scope two emission and indirect emission, namely, emission coming from uh, energy are lower. Uh, so there might be also some level of uh, reconsideration and if you like optimization uh, regarding where you will be importing things from. And I know no, and I, I know that we were talking a lot about the challenges here, but I know quite a few firms who are also looking at this as an opportunity because they have made material investments in decarbonizing their supply chain and, and manufacturing processes. So going forward with this regime, they will actually become preferred suppliers into different supply chains as a result of, of that cost and embedded carbon differential that, that Luca was talking about. So there is also an opportunity here um, for businesses, not just the compliance costs and eventual um, monetary costs. 
And, and William, from, from what you've picked up in consulting with uh, the network of uh, 53 accredited chambers, what, what, what's the kind of um, feedback, what's the feeling on the ground um, towards the, the CBAM? Well, I think there's been good take up of the guidance uh, issued by the European Commission. So there was a, a document, uh, the revised version is about 250 pages. Uh, which I know many companies in the network have been through and discussed and come to us seeking points of clarification upon, uh, have been speaking to their suppliers. So I think the level of preparedness and readiness um, was was fine. Or I think particularly of those companies with an awareness that their goods are in scope. What our surveys over the summer have found is that companies who are not in scope really have not paid much attention to what CBAM is or know much of it at all. So uh, for the moment, it has been something that um, you know producers of cement or fertilizer, hydrogen, steel and iron, aluminium um, have really gotten into, uh, but others perhaps not so much. Um, yeah. There is an element, I would say, of where there's been a consideration and absorbing of the requirements and the necessary embedding of compliance processes into production processes. Um, but I think there's still a little bit of distance between the kind of comms and materials that they would want to see uh, from the European Commission uh, applicable to third country economic operators and those which are available. And we've communicated that little gap to the UK government and to the Commission. And hopefully there will be uh, a slightly modified suite of comms that will come forward. Um, thus far, I, most companies are fine. There's a few that have indicated they've got problems, particularly where uh, you're talking about mill certificates. Um, and it can be difficult to find those in certain kinds of transactions, uh, certain amounts of, of processing that's gone on subsequent to original importation of the steel. Um, so that's been one issue, whether we can find some flexibilities and efficiencies in certain circumstances uh, to not require mill certificates and some alternative evidential basis. Um, so that's been really the main thing that's fed into us. And of course, we've been speaking to the UK government and to the European Union about those. That's that's interesting. And it's interesting you mentioned mill certificate because um, uh, as, as an anecdote from um, our day to day, of course, as you know, we we help uh, traders, uh, you know, bring goods into the UK. And we heard um, that goods have been stopped in Europe for not having mill certificates, whether they are mandatory or not at this stage. Uh, you know, of course, you always have uh, some who interpret the the rules to the to the letter, and they don't realise when when they're actually in force or not. Um, so it's 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 already happening. We are having some interesting questions uh, from from the panel, and uh, I wonder if we want to take. Um, uh, um, I think Lucas picked one. I was just pointing at that one on my screen, but clearly virtually Luke and Ruth. So absolutely, we have a, an interesting question uh, from Ruth um, about carbon leakage and whether that is actually a real thing at this point or just a theoretical construct. What, what do you think? Um, two part answers here. Um, the first one is we do uh, we do have some anecdotal evidence of uh, of leakage. Uh, anecdotal is in certainly in certain industry or certain installation moving outside the borders of a of Europe. Um, in, in connection to higher cost of electricity and higher cost due to CO two. So in particular, there's um, aluminium smelters moving outside the. European borders in the past uh, in the past years. So we do have anecdotal evidence of that. As Ruth was asking, is probably is that actually a, you know like a, a industry wide uh, uh, phenomena? It's not, but it's not for a very I believe simple reason. Um, the way the 
the European Emission Training System has been designed, and currently as, as well, the UK system has been is designed. There are provisions within the system that try to mitigate as much as possible the uh, loss of competitiveness of energy intensive trade exposed industries. So you need to take that into account. You cannot abstract from that. And even today, I was reading that the German coalition government has been agreeing to extend the package relief for electricity intensive uh, companies. So to you, to basically answer to your question, Ruth, we don't have the answer is a no, there's no actually leakage, but it's also a no condition on the fact that industries have been uh, given quite generous allocation or alternative relief measure like reduction of electricity cost. So it's, it's quite difficult to disentangle these effects. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you for that. I, I, I wonder if we could um, um, discuss some of the practicalities. I know it's, it might be early, but um, I just wanted to see if we could discuss some of the practicalities on who's responsible for this. So when the goods are crossing the border, um, that, that's where CBAM kicks in. So I mean, at the moment, we're talking about the European border. Um, but who's responsible? Is it the, the foreign exporter? that has to provide the information or does the responsibility lies with the importer um, and and actually there was a specific question is there a connection with the inco terms applied the international uh, trade terms that decide in a commercial contract who's responsible for what so do, do we know can we clarify any of that May if I jump in um, on on this particular question, and and it's a great one with the linkages to the the inco terms. What the legislation sets out that it's the importer of record that is the is responsible for submitting the CBAM declaration. Now that's something that even if a a firm is using an indirect representative, but established within the EU, it is on the um it is on an the established entity to become a, the registered cbam declarant for those that aren't established within the eu but using an indirect representative it is for the indirect representative to submit the cbam declaration um at this stage this is the current guidance that we have obviously with the caveat that this is subject to change potentially um however what we've been finding is that during the transition period there is, you know, a, a degree of willingness, I would say, among the indirect representative community, whether that's customs brokers or others, um, to to take on the responsibility. They are much more cautious around the um, eventual um, cost implications because that would leave them liable for potentially quite um, large uh, need, yeah, needing to buy um, CBAM certificates, and also the fact that we do have enforcement. And compliance mechanisms within the regime where after two or more incomplete or inaccurate reports um, that quite serious penalties can be applied um, for the first two reports you can see a penalty being applied of between 10 and 50 euros per ton of unreported emissions so it's not just a theoretical oh you submit the report and that's that there are actually um some fairly serious um, consequences for for not doing so, and then just to to link to a next the next question, staying on the practicalities, and there's a question that's been asked around um, inward processing relief. So, in terms of inward processing, there is um, there are sort of special mechanisms within CBAM where elements still need to be reported, but not the full um, requirement. The reason for that is um, they don't want products coming in for inward processing, but then entering free circulation without and effectively evading the C necessary CBAM reporting. So it's not just, it, it still applies to a degree to products brought in under um, inward processing. But but when they get diverted to home to the home market? Oh no, even, even when they're brought in for inward processing, it's just a lesser level of reporting requirement that exists. Great, 
that's 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 a very very interesting clarification so that, that's great thank you very much and i wonder if if we stay on the practicalities there was another one um to do with um using the product in uh, uh within your production line coming from different suppliers and therefore having different levels uh, of carbon i think ammonia was uh, one of the examples what what is the practical approach because i mean clearly each company i suppose that behind this question is like a company might have a mechanism to know that <clears throat> a certain product has a certain footprint and actually at the moment it, the moment you start taking into account the different supply chains it might be more difficult to calculate no definitely and and that is something that we're still um still looking at what i would say is there are product specific rules for the calculation of embedded emissions ammonia um, having very specific rules. So we'd need to go in and, and look at the, the exact um, rules that have been set out in the guidance. One of the things I would say um, in, you know, with, with a degree of circumspection is there is a huge amount we still don't know about this regime. Um, in terms of the guidance um, that, that was sent out that only happened in August and, and was by far incomplete. We still don't have the default values being published. And even, you know, we only have 20 of the 27 member states who have nominated their competent authorities for the purposes of CBAM. Um, there are still seven um, countries within the EU where we don't know who is ultimately going to be responsible for the new regime. So while we do have a lot of information and we're talking about it um, here today um, it is something that that is under sort of active revision and and we are getting more information all the time so it's something to definitely watch out for absolutely thanks i mean one of the questions at the back of my mind was when you mentioned that you know uh, the first incorrect report will attract this penalty and the second incorrect report will attract that penalty the question is which is the competent authority and what are the universally accepted values that we're going to compare the so-called wrong report with and you know is there a universally recognized and accepted standardized way to calculate those emissions there isn't um is is the fundamental um answer to that question i think it's also very interesting that among the member states there's quite a lot of divergence as to who is ultimately responsible as the competent authority so some member states have chosen their customs authority some have picked the ministry of finance or equivalent and others have picked their environment or climate change departments so and you know how collectively across those different um, not just countries, but also departments and how they approach different um, regulations and the application of those reg regulations potentially leaves quite a large level of divergence between member states as, as we see the application of the new regime. So it, it is something that we're watching very closely because of some of the risks that that, that entails. Fantastic, thank you. Now, if we zoom out from the practicalities, since we, we don't actually, pro probably we don't know yet, but uh, um, if we zoom out, there's another question uh, on the list um, that is wondering if, um, you know, the need to trace carbon emissions will make it more difficult to operate distribution models where there are multiple third parties between the manufacturer and the end user. Now, I can I can see William nodding, and I was hoping that you'd have a, a view on that, especially considering how many complex supply chains our UK traders are often involved with. There's no doubt that it will. Um, and of course, if the UK decides to introduce uh, its own CBAM, um, even if you know ostensibly the most significant elements will, will be um, in terms of rest of the world goods, um, if we can achieve ETS linkage uh, with the EU, uh, which could still be a very difficult process. I think it took the Swiss seven years to agree uh, terms with the EU on that, but at least the TCA uh, relevance, I think, helps. Um, yes, it will, is the, is the short answer, because um, with a UK system, you would have to account for the... Uh, the importer of records in the UK would have to account for the uh, embedded emissions and the product that they're bringing in. And then if those products are transformed uh, in some way and not just simply transited through the UK um, or 
repackaged, um, but if they are transformed, um, you know, then you know there are going to be consequences um, if you uh, re-export those goods uh, to another country which which has a sea bump. So, so yes, I mean, uh, potentially if we end up with a world of of small sea bumps. Um, then the protectionist element for this becomes, I think, fairly obvious. Um, and it will be interesting to see whether, you know, if the EU's approach um, effectively leads to a sort of plurilateral CBAM with countries saying, well, you know, the EU is a significant trading partner for us. And therefore, what we will look to do is to secure linkage so that our goods, at least produced domestically, uh, can uh, be exempt from uh, the fiscal consequences of having to export into uh, the EU and um, to pay the, the difference in, in the carbon pricing. So um, so I think, yes, it, it is a, as I say, we, we've got two approaches in, in the world at the moment. Potentially, we could say what China is doing is, is a third one. You've got the US approach, which has been to use the fiscal firepower, recreate the market, you know, uh, catalyze investment in green technology on an awesome scale. Um, and then you've got the EU and um, other countries which are looking at uh, trying to approach the same problem through carbon pricing and mechanisms like, like these. Um, but I suppose what the what what both sets of policies emphasize is just how far removed we are from the 1995 sort of sense that uh, uh, when China had joined the World Trade Organization that everyone would simply uh, react well to a rules-based order forever in a day. Um, it hasn't worked out, out that way. That's uh, that's interesting. Um, Ruth asked uh, another question. So if we again, if we continue expanding our, our uh, point of view, uh, and Ruth's quoting a uh, London School of Economics report um, saying that um, the saying that the EU C ban would cost Africa um, up to twenty five billion per year, and you know, uh, in in consideration of you know the the different uh, amount of per capita emissions. Um, you know, what What do you panelists support? Do you support a view of, um, you know, uh, exonerating uh, development countries from CBAM or, or applying some mechanism like that? You know, maybe try and have a, a, a start to this, a stab. Um, so so we, we, we mentioned already that one of the primary motivation or the two key primary motivations for any sort of uh, border carbon adjustment is addressing carbon leakage concerns and ensure this uh, level playing field. But I think there is a very is a very important third element that is promotion of poly policy action in foreign countries. Uh, I think I believe this is a very important driver uh, behind the introduction of the EU CBAM. And I've been working on carbon pricing for the past 15 years. And I have to say that after the conversation about CBAM where it became more concrete, I've seen many more countries adopting some sort of carbon pricing instruments. So certainly EU aims to encourage other countries to adopt policies that try to measure and reduce their greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so having said that, um, I understand it with concern. I had a quick look at that report. I haven't read it in detail. I don't entirely agree uh, with the calculations I've done, but based on assumptions, so assumptions are always debatable, including mine. Um, I, I, though, uh, consider this as an opportunity also to create funds uh, that can be used to help developing countries in uh, adopting their very own policies. I know that Senegal is considering something, Rwanda as well, um, in terms of policy. The, the key element here of the adjustment uh, is the second component uh, that uh, George was mentioning. So one is the emission intensity. The second one is this equivalency, how you will calculate that equivalency 
in policy is a straightforward difference between pricing one minus pricing two, uh, that's it, or will you uh, take into account some sort of adjustment? And if not, part of the, re the, the revenues uh, that you are collecting by selling CBAM certificates, I think will be uh, sold, um, set them aside and definitely help developing countries in, in their journey to decarbonize. George, William, anything that you would like to add or to comment on that point? Just one um, addition, and just to, to preface this, but this is very much a personal opinion, um, is that if you look at, in particular, LDCs, um, currently there's only one LDC who will be impacted by the CBAM regime, and that's Mozambique um, for the, some of the bauxite and aluminium exports they have to the EU. Um, there are no substantial exports on, on any of the other covered products. That would change quite dramatically um, if you moved into the expanded scope of the CBAM. So it's an issue that, that will need to be looked at. And I would definitely be in favor of finding some mechanism in particular for the least developed countries, given that we have everything that arms, given that we have many other mechanisms in trade um, to support their development objectives. Um, on some of the the other developing countries, I think it's a much harder question because you do have, in particular, many developing countries, and and the BRICS are a good example in the WTO sense with you know very um, carbon intensive industries, and you know finding a way to address that carbon leakage is is an important consideration. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, great. So. Um, I think we have time for just a couple more questions, if you guys want. Now we're going back into the, uh, the specifics, and I don't know how much uh, uh, steering or uh, direction we can give. Um, so um, one of the questions is to do with um, textile goods and uh, importing textile goods into the UK, packaging and then re-exporting. Is this would this fall under the current CBAM structure? It wouldn't. That's fine. That's a nice and easy answer. So sorry, just looking at um, the question. So in terms of the current, um, in terms of the current regime, textiles aren't covered, and if you look at the expanded scope, still um, they they wouldn't be covered under the current what what has been published by the European Commission where you start to get things to like packaging um it really depends on what hs codes are used um in order to import the product because that's how ultimately the regime um deems um a product covered or not so if you were exporting um packaging so whether that's cardboard or or other products um to the eu under an expanded cbam scope then that would likely be covered by the the expanded regime but if you are just using one box in a consignment, um, it's not. It, it's unlikely that that would be covered. The kicker to all of this, um, though, is to remember that CBAM isn't the only regulation that needs to be considered. Plastic packaging taxes and extended producer responsibility for waste um, also need to be factored in when looking at, at questions around um, packaging and, and how those products are accounted for. Um, when when it comes to international trade, I think I think that's absolutely true. And I think f from one of my takeaway and and homework pieces is to keep an eye on the interaction between the existing schemes, such as the uh, you know the plastic tax, as we call it in, amongst friends, and and CBAM and how you know what what do you need to report and where do you have things that kick in? I think that that will be a challenge going forward. It looks like it's becoming more complex. <clears throat> so um, there is another question that I was uh, invite I would invite you to to have a look at. And it's um, to do with um, trading um, carbon credits. It's, um, it's to do with um, a solar power plants, energy storage, and so, uh, sodium ion batteries production. So they're producing that, and you know, what, the, the question is, you know, what, where to look into to what what would happen to them. 
and if that's a bit too specific, we can also say, and and, and that's that's absolutely fair. It's, it's it's a very specific question. <laughs> no, and and thanks for the question. I think one one of the things that is is interesting about the CBAM regime is the commission has chosen not to allow companies to use um, voluntary carbon credits when it comes to the CBAM regime. It it is quite clearly a regime that is linked to the um, EU's um, ETS where those CBAM certificates will be linked to a weekly average of the ETS price and the CBAM certificates will only be allowed to be used for CBAM purposes. So you will have to buy them from the authority and then there's a small amount that can be sold back every year um, if you haven't used your full allocation of certificates that bought. So it, it it's currently not a regime that is um, is compatible with the voluntary carbon credit market that's that's great i think that's a Can I brilliant just answer add, so of course luca please um, my understanding is basically there will be a pay and rebate kind of so you just pay you buy basically a certificates when you need one you can't trade those uh, cbam certificates you can sell them back to the authority um, at the price at which you both them initially and as George was uh, mentioning at the moment it's not yet clear how exactly that price will be determined de facto is like a tax is exactly like a tax adjustment you buy just what you need and if you haven't used them probably because of some calculations um uh in uh, some sort of confidence intervals around the calculation you've been doing you can just uh, sell them back to the authority that's great. Well, thank you very much for that. So I think we only have a few minutes left. So um, to conclude this uh, really interesting panel with like lots and lots of uh, um, useful advice and reflection on what's going to happen, I just wanted to invite you to conclude with some final thoughts um, or some final tips and hints for traders and companies that have uh, uh, you know followed this conversation today. What what are the top priorities or the top hints that we can give them on CBAM. And uh, William, if I could come to you first. Okay, I, I think the first thing is that we can expect CBAM to be here to stay. Um, there are people who say, well, is it really justifiable under the WTO? But of course, uh, given the sort of states that the this YouTube that the appellate body is in at the moment, uh, Good luck in being able to sort of challenge this in a in a meaningful way. So, I think it's here to stay. It will it will develop. Uh, so we have to I think get get used to it. And I think the key thing for companies in the UK is to be speaking to their customers in the EU, uh, to make sure they are set up to be as George and Luca said the importer of record, to ensure that they're speaking to their fast parcel operators or couriers. Uh, to look at their role in the chain. And also as companies either making goods from scratch or making goods from intermediate products and transforming them into, into new goods for export, be very aware of your supply chains and remember that um, you know, intermediate inputs you know, can form part of the chain that you've got to report uh, to to your customers in in the EU, um, I think the best tip is to find, uh, preferably, you know your customs team within the company to take the lead on this. Make sure that someone is driving compliance measures through the company. Uh, but for several sectors, um, CBAM compliance is going to augment and become part of the daily production processes, uh, given particularly for iron and steel, uh, you know, the scale of things that you have to report uh, and gases going into, uh, you know, the making of goods, uh, with, with, which include those, those products and the precursors. So um, make good That's adjustments, uh, take good advice, lots of it out there and get ready because this is going to be a permanent thing. That's great. Thank you very much, um, William. And uh, Luca, can I come back to you for some final words or consideration or hints and sure. tips on CPAM? Uh, I'll be uh, very brief and I would like to make you maybe try to 
end on a positive note. So I, I appreciate that uh, a lot of new regulations are typically met with uh, quite some resistance. It's obviously uh, can be only extra paperwork, so it can be paperwork plus cost, and that might be an opportunity that one, one of those cases. But I think there is also uh, lots of opportunities here. In particular, as George was mentioning earlier, in looking and identify ways to actually uh, improve the level of the emission intensity of your of your uh, supply uh, chain or your production. Uh, so I, I, in a way, to basically gain you uh, share of the market. So I think there are there are opportunities as well in the story with Siba. That's great. Thank you very much. And last but not least, George, if I could come to you for some final words. Thank you. Um, a, a couple of practical tips um, as, as we move forward to the first reporting period um, on the 31st of January 2024. Um, one is definitely go to your customs team and check the historic HS codes um, and map that against CBAM coverage. Um, that will give you a good idea as to, to whether you're directly exposed or not. If you are register to be a CBAM declarant or as, as William said, um, uh, talk to to your indirect uh, representative. The third um, is start tracking those other data requirements that are necessary, particularly from the 1st of October through to the, the 31st, and then really embed this into your ongoing trade compliance, um, environmental compliance work um, as part of the business. Um, this is something that is going to continue and it, it will need to move to that sort of strategic um, elements within the business going forward. That's great. Thank you very much. So I think that's all we have time for. So um, thank you very much, George Riddle, Director of Trade Policy and Strategy at, at EY, uh, Professor Luca Taschini from the Edinburgh University, and uh, William Bain, Head of Trade Policy at the BCC. Thank you very much. We will be sharing a recording of this uh, webinar. Thank you and have a lovely afternoon.